anything chapter three will tell us is that the market is the, the mechanism by which we are most efficient, that at a certain price point, a certain amount of goods will be produced and a certain amount of consumption will take place. And we want to find that equilibrium point. Okay, that equilibrium point is where we can do the most business. Now, it may not be for everybody. If the equilibrium point for a cup of coffee because of coffee being shortages goes to $5 a cup, you may have the ability to pay $5 a cup of coffee, but maybe you just don't have the willingness at that point in time. Or vice versa, you have the willingness, but you don't have the $5 because you're spending it on other things. And then the market will find a way to kind of calm itself back down. If anybody tries to get overpriced with, with uh, a product, the market will determine it. And I think you, if you understand what eBay does, eBay is the ultimate capitalist marketplace. You can put, along with 100 other people, the same product on there in the same condition. And whatever price point you put, well, if somebody beats you by 50 cents on price and that gets sold like this, boom, that's the equilibrium point. Now, if nobody else goes and lowers their price by 50 cents, you're the next one up. Boom. So that's the next equilibrium. So whatever will bear. I mean, if I, all the time you see people, and I, I go eBay because I do collectibles and stuff on eBay. And I see stuff there that I'm going like, oh, yeah, right. Like you really put that, you know, you want $5,000 for this championship ring, but you know what? You're not getting it. Well, I sold one and it was, you know, two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, and it was $3,000. You're not getting five for it. So the market will take care of itself. You price yourself out of the market, you're not going to get the sale. If you're too low, then people will scarf it up. You'd be like, wow, gee, wow, somebody just bought, somebody just sold this for 25% more than what I did. Should have, I should have priced it higher. So the market does its best to provide us that most efficient set of circumstances. So I'm going to allocate of efficiency, production efficiency, you know, the efficiency of your, you and your budget and your wallet, you know, trying to figure out as a consumer. And this is where the market is good at. You know, if, if Acme or ShopRite are too expensive for basic needs and you could do without brand names, go to Aldi or Lidl over in North Brunswick when it opens. Uh, that's what they're there for. You know, if you, if you don't need to know exactly, if you don't have to have Heinz ketchup and you just need ketchup, okay, Aldi might have it cheaper for you. All right, but that's where those companies tend to live. They find their own little market for, for goods and service, for, for goods like that, foodstuffs. And, you know, for that consumer who either doesn't want to pay high prices or is content with saving some extra money, they're there for them. And, and you know, this is the kind of God bless America moment. God bless you know, the fact that we have a wonderful dynamic marketplace where you can do that, where you have an Aldi and a shop, right? And you can pick and choose. You have brand names and you have off brands and you have store brands. But this particular video is about when everything goes wrong. And when it goes wrong, you can usually look to some kind of government intervention as part of it. Now, again, Adam Smith, laissez-faire capitalism, no government interference. That's not happening, okay? Let's, let's just get that right off the top. There is no such thing as pure laissez-faire capitalism. eBay is the closest marketplace to that, but you cannot produce goods in this country that are harmful. You cannot produce goods in this country using slave labor, prison labor, sweatshop labor, okay, you can't. So the idea that you can do things, everything you want without any kind of government incrimination, recriminations is, is wrong. The problem here is that when government not only provides the safe legal environment that circumscribes the market, but then starts intervening for political reasons in areas that it shouldn't necessarily do. So we have two examples in chapter three. One is called a price floor, and the other one is called a price ceiling. So I'm going to share screen and I'm going to bring up a, a chart that's one thing I would have drawn in class. So we'll take a look at that. So let me just kind of share screen. Okay, and this is the price ceiling graph. All right, the price ceiling graph. Look at where the market look at where the market is for this product. The equilibrium point point E is where buyers buy and sellers sell. You can see that it's at price level P and quantity Q will be provided, and this is where the transaction takes place. Obviously, sellers want to take more money, buyers want it cheaper, 
this is where the market is for, for the best combination of circumstances. And there's always people who want it cheaper and there's always people on the producer side who want to charge more, but this is where we are. Okay, <clears throat> point E is where the market would be for whatever product this is. Okay, now there are definite, this is not like a laboratory experiment. There are definite examples, and the book talks about one, we'll use it in a minute to, to describe this particular chart. This is where the, the equilibrium point is. For political reasons, political reasons, okay, should reasons, okay, not normative, not, not, not positive economics, normative economics, should reasons. <clears throat> this is why the government jumps in and establishes a ceiling price that is below the market equilibrium. And the example given here is rent control. Uh, any of you who've driven to JFK Airport, you've passed by neighborhoods there, Brighton Beach area, okay, lots of those 30, 20 story, 30 story apartment buildings. Most of them, if not all of them, are rent controlled. Meaning that grandma, who's been living there since 1952, has the price controlled by the government. Now you're talking about New York City. If those rents were allowed to go market, complete market, grandma would probably have to pay four, five, six times for being down at Brighton Beach. You're near Coney Island. That's ideal you know, landscape. And uh, the price would might be go, go crazy. And that's like one of the jokes that it's touched on in the, in the TV show Friends only once or twice, I think during the first four seasons, they talk about it, but after that, it's not really talked about, is that the apartment that Monica has, which is the main setting of the show Friends, is a rent-controlled apartment that Monica got control of when her grandmother died. Now, when the apartment lease is broken or goes up or you know, it, it changes hands, the, I don't know about exactly about the rules about the, 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 the uh, rent control rules in New York City, but it probably should be reevaluated at least, and if not, let to go fully market. And here's a bunch of 20-somethings who have, you know, some of them have good jobs, some of them don't, and they're affording an apartment, in this case, in Soho, down in lower Manhattan, down there by NYU. And, you know, if you ever, if you ever price out, Bedford and Grove Streets is technically where, this, where they're supposed to be. If you price out apartments in there, you can see what I'm talking about down that area. Uh, and, and Monica controls it as a rent control. And they make hints about it a couple of times when the super, when the, when the super in the building, the superintendent of the building, you know, kind of gives them flack for something. But, you know, if you let markets take that over, all those people are going to be kicked out and those buildings are going to go crazy price up. And so the, the city of New York under the legislation of the city puts rent control in, allowing the rents to go up a small amount. Now, obviously, if you think about the circumstances here, you're in a good neighborhood in the sense of look at where you are, Brighton Beach, the Russian neighborhood is there. Um, a lot of Russians, Russian you know, Christians, Russian Jews have moved into that neighborhood over time. There are uh, Latinos who live closer to Coney Island, but there's Coney Island, there's a beach, there's an amusement park. It's, 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 it's a nice place to be. You're not in, you know, you're not, not packed in an area that has no curb appeal, no, no visual appeal, no, no recreational appeal. So you can just think that at that cheap price, there must be a lot of people who will demand those kind of apartments. So we'll edit right here. Uh, let me get into the uh, drawing aspects of this. Okay. So if we're, if we're talking about being on the demand curve, if we're talking about being at that price point where the red dot is, look at what's gonna happen. You're gonna have all of this demand for those kind of apartments. Now those apartments are finite. You're not building new apartment buildings down there. Okay, there are only a certain number of those apartments in those, in those big block apartment buildings. My, my mother-in-law always jokes when we're driving her back to the airport from, to, to pick up her plane to Moscow, that that's Moscow. I mean, it is true, except in Moscow, they don't have them that high. They're all at 10 stories, maybe 15 tops. But look at the demand for that. At the artificial price point, there is more demand than at point E, okay? Much more demand here than what it would be from there to, you know, in Q, to Q sub D. Wow, everybody would want that. 
I mean, think about it. You're in New York City. You're right near the beach. Great. But think about it now from the perspective of the supplier or builder of these apartments. Okay. They are not happy. They are only willing to supply Q sub F amounts because they can't make profit on it. The government is constraining their ability to make profit. So in this case, look at what's been created. The quantity demanded is here in the red line and the quantity supplied is here. This is going to create a shortage. Why, should, why would you build it? Why would you build apartments? What you would build is condos. You get a piece of property down there, if you can, if you can get it licensed and zoned as a condo, you build it as a condo, because you can sell those condos for whatever you want and charge association fees for the superintendent and maintenance and all that kind of stuff. But this is gonna create a shortage. So price ceilings create shortage of that which you think you know, you know, this was done politically to help grandma out so she could stay in her apartment. Nice gesture. It's a should gesture. Should we do that? Yeah, we should do that. But it's not economically a good move because builders have no incentive to add apartments at this point in time. None. You can't mandate a private business to build apartments. The government is not going to build them. They don't have that kind of money. I don't want to get into the house building or home building department, but that's what's creating. We, we could have been at point E. We could have been right here. Okay, we could have been right there, happy at Q, but we've created a shortage from where the market was and a bigger shortage if you consider the demand that would be there for cheap, reduced price apartments. Now, you could get into a lot of other arguments. East Brunswick is a rent control community as well. I lived in an apartment up Cranberry Road, across from PNC Bank when I first moved here. The rent went up a couple of percent to two percent a year. That's okay, that's fine. I, you know, I was not struggling with that. But now you get into legislation and you get into court cases, such as what's called the Mount Laurel decision from the 1980s, where communities had to build affordable housing. You couldn't indirectly red line. I remember your AP history or US2 history here. Talk about what, what Levitt did by getting the banks to red line around Levittown, keeping blacks and Hispanics out. You know, you can keep low income people out of East Brunswick by building big, by not building apartments, but by building McMansions. You wanna keep the riffraff out? This is what you do. And the court said, no, you have to section off a certain amount of uh, of apartments that is affordable. Now, again, affordable in Middlesex County is not gonna be the same as affordable in Cumberland County or Salem County down south. But in Mayor Cohen's big grand vision, which is to take three dilapidated properties, one they're working on, which used to be a Sunshine Bread Factory on Tice's Road, Tice's Lane, uh, the dilapidated, nobody's in it, Wiz property, it was, we called the Wiz because there was one store called the Wiz that was in it, shopping center, and then the Lowman shopping center where there's retro fitness and the produce store, and create apartments on top of kind of small shops and designate some of those, he put away in his plan for the you know, Committee on Affordable Housing, the, uh, the you know, kind of government oversight committee, to say, yeah, we'll, we'll allow, like, you know, but this will be you know, affordable for East Brunswick, meaning that it's not going to be affordable for somebody who has a minimum wage job. It's going to be affordable for a first time a beginning teacher who's making $50,000 a year. But there's no incentive to do it otherwise. Why would you build? You know, why would I build an apartment building? I could build condos and sell them for ridiculous amounts of money. Those apartments that are on Cranberry Road just before you get to the high school, Okay, those are just basically apartments that turned into condos. And when I first started looking for a house, they were charging $250,000 for those apartments. It's an apartment building, an old 1960s apartment building. You're paying $200,000 plus. I got my house for $300,000. Now I got a backyard, a basement, and I don't have neighbors you know, up, down, and around me. So let's you know, understand that, that the political consequences of creating uh, an artificial ceiling 
creates a shortage. Now, here's another example where this really hurt in reality. Venezuela is an oil producing country. They decided when Chavez took over in the early 2000s as a socialist, that he was going to bring the price of gasoline down so that all the people could afford gasoline. Great. The market price for gasoline should be $2 a gallon equivalent in whatever Venezuelan currency, the Bolivar is, whatever it is. $2, $3 a gallon? It's 25 cents a gallon in Venezuela. Great, everybody's lining up. But you know what? The market that would have taken that profit at $3 a gallon and reinvest it back into the oil industry is not there. So yeah, he's selling lots of gallons at 25 cents a gallon, but there's no money going back into the industry and Venezuela's oil industry has since collapsed to the point of being ridiculously bad. And any foreign help that came in there was either taken over by the government or chased out by the government to the point where nobody is going to help Venezuela as long as it still remains a socialist enclave. Not happening. So you create a shortage of gasoline in Venezuela, a shortage of heating fuel, even though it's an oil rich country because the artificial price ceiling did not incentivize the market to take the money and put it back in and to the oil industry. It's a state run oil company too. So it's like, you know, get out of it, get out of your own way. So price ceilings, artificial, they are done below market equilibrium price. They are designed for political reasons, not economic reasons. And they are ineffective and they create a shortage of the very thing that you are trying to protect, a shortage, because there is no incentive to produce at that point. Remember, this line right here, let me, let me highlight this in the kind of in the yellow, this supply line right here, all right, it is upsloping for a reason. The reason being that as the price goes up, more manufacturers would be willing to jump in. More production could be diverted or to that product because they're making more profit on it. Okay, let's not, let's not confuse ourselves. Business is in it for profit. Okay, so that's our price ceiling. Again, ceiling below market equilibrium. Now, we're gonna stop this. I'm going to um, jump to another Okay, graph here, and this is the graph for a price floor, an artificial price floor where you can't go below that. Okay, can't go below that. This is seen mainly in states and specific products that are dealing with agriculture. You might not think that Pennsylvania is, you know, kind of a red state, but... Basically, you've got Pittsburgh on one side, Philadelphia on the other, and Kentucky in the middle. It's an agricultural state. There's a lot of agriculture being produced there. And the Pennsylvania legislature created an artificial floor for the price of milk so that the price would never fall below that floor, so that dairy farmers would be protected. Now, remember, if you are a politician, you represent your district. If your district produces cars, you will throw up tariffs against Japanese, Korean, German cars just to protect the jobs. Because jobs protected means yours is protected. You get reelected. Politics. And that's, we'll, we'll deal more with that kind of stuff in Chapter 5 when we talk about protectionism. But you are protecting the dairy farmers. Now, agriculture, you have to understand, agriculture... You could do everything right and still go out of business. If you grow coffee in some third world country and you have a great crop of coffee, you should make tons of money. And you're thinking, this is great. Everything worked. And yet every other country in the world that sells coffee or grows coffee had a great crop. And suddenly now there's tons more coffee on the market than what is necessary. The price collapses. You go bankrupt. So we've got to protect the farmers by charging that. Now, was it a significant difference growing up in Pennsylvania? The answer is yes. Anytime, I had an aunt who lived in Willingboro, New Jersey, and there was a bridge from Bristol to Burlington, New Jersey. So any time that a, we were over visiting my aunt, my dad would make a stop at a local market. In fact, there was actually a drive-up market right by the Burlington-Bristol Bridge as you're on your way out and pick up a gallon of milk, a loaf of bread, because it was cheaper. Lot, uh, 40 or 50 cents cheaper a gallon back in 1970 is cheap. 
I mean, it, it, it's something to, to save. And if you're there, and I, hit, I said, drive up, you pull up to the car, you yell at the guy, give me a gallon of milk, a loaf of white bread, boom, boom, okay, three, two bucks, whatever it is, and out we go. Take it home. Yep. No price floors, no price ceilings. Also helped with liquor, too, because in Pennsylvania, the liquor, the liquor sales are controlled by the state, one price. And you can come to New Jersey and find it a lot cheaper there, too, because you have competitors competing against, private liquor stores competing against each other. But let's stick to the agricultural part. Let's talk about milk. All right, in this case, here's that, here's that ceiling. Okay, we're going we're gonna, to gonna go, go, go edit. We'll draw on it again. Okay, so you know, here's that, that floor. The price can't go below there. So your price can't go below this. All right, so wonderful. The price is above the market equilibrium. Here's the market equilibrium, that's where it should be. At price level P, you would have Q quantity provided. Now, suppliers are happy, happy, happy because they're getting so much and they'd be willing to supply that much they're supplying that much but consumers are hesitant they are not buying it they are going across the border and they are that demanding that much so in this case you look the producers are producing more than what was required under market conditions Consumers aren't buying it, so that makes it even worse. So what you've created here is a surplus. A surplus is just as inefficient as a shortage. You create a surplus. You created more supply than demand. Now, especially with a perishable product, you have to be careful with that. You can't just keep shipping the market because, you know, the Acme markets or the shop rights in there are going to say, hey, guys, look, I'm, you know, nobody's buying this stuff. But it's also inefficient. And it's tough to say to a business, to a family farm, a dairy farm, a vegetable farm, whatever, that, hey, market conditions, you know what? If you can't cut it at the lower price, goodbye. But capitalism doesn't have a conscience, a heart doesn't feel sympathetic here. Capitalism says dinosaurs must die. Can't protect them. The old family farmer who can't do what the big corporate farms can do is gonna be put out of business. But no, you have legislation that protects the agricultural output in these particular products. Now you can think about any, any you know, citrus in Florida or tobacco in North Carolina and Virginia, you know, you can think about beef in Oklahoma, Nebraska. You're going to find that this is, you know, this is what they're going to do. They're going to protect those industries when there's a threat to lower prices that could hurt those farmers. But it gives you the false sense of security that, you know, you're going to get away with this. Efficiency requires destruction of businesses. Like I said, the dinosaurs have to die. It's not, you know, in capitalism, dinosaurs die. But if you artificially jump in, and again, creating a surplus, it's inefficient. I mean, why, why do you need to convert? I mean, maybe you should convert some of those dairy farms to producing vegetables or turn them into beef production farms or pig farms or something like that, chicken farms. Because, you know, and, and what we've seen in, literally in the dairy industry, this, the Borden Dairies has gone bankrupt. Another Tuscan went out bankrupt uh, two years ago. A lot of the, the larger uh, industries like this are going bankrupt because they're not buy we're not buying the milk. You know, between our lifestyle choices, uh, health-wise, or we're going vegan, you know, just not buying, you know, cow milk. Oh, well. But again, this is a case where for a price floor, the price is above where it should be. You're protecting suppliers. Consumers are saying, eh. And again, what happens in a case like this is that if you have the opportunity to cross a border, whether it is because of a price floor that is created for the agricultural support of farmers, or it's an artificial price floor created by a specific syntax or excise tax on cigarettes, you go across the border. 
or if you're driving back from from Florida, now you know you stop at this one supermarket of tobacco. I mean, literally, it is the size of a supermarket. The cigar humidor is the size of H hall, uh, and you load up on cigarettes and bring them back, you know, for your own personal consumption. So yeah, in, in, in inefficiency, corruption like this creates certain circumstances where if you're near a border where it's cheaper, that's where you go. So market disequilibrium caused here by the government intervening and creating these situations. In the artificial floor case, it's either through uh, protection of a, of a particular industry or in the case of an excise tax, meaning you're, you're trying to get people away from smoking cigarettes, you put it up there high and you try to frustrate it. But that, that is not a supplier issue. Suppliers aren't getting any more money from that tax. It just cuts the bar up there. Suppliers supply what they can. They sell them to wholesalers who sell them to retailers who then sell them to people. So, yeah, all right, stop share. Oh, excuse me. So, I mean, this is the craziness of the market when the government gets involved here. And, and it happens in a variety of ways, in a variety of things. Uh, every country does that. Kodak Film had a hard time getting sold in, in Japan because Fuji Film wanted to. I mean, we're talking about camera film, actually film film. Uh, demanded protection. So like I said, we're going to talk a lot about those protection issues in our next chapter. We're going to skip chapter four and we're going to go to five and talk about trade. And we'll talk about protectionism in more detail, but it's not an efficient thing. It doesn't provide us that kind of, you know, perfectly in tune marketplace. It is what it is. Okay. Enough of that. Again, if you have any questions, put them on the FAQ page for chapter three and I will get back to you. So.